Before continuing on with this video, make sure you've seen part one of my top five in case you haven't already. If you have watched through it, welcome back, thanks for sticking around, and let's get right into it. Family is our favorite thing. Well, that's just super. I Wait, what did you just say? Taking the number three spot on the best side of things, we have Brain Lord, an episode about Mojo disguising himself as an alien superhero that comes to Townsville looking for a new home. What sticks out to me most about Brain Lord is the way that the episode provides him with a new perspective on his arch nemeses, seeing as he gets to experience firsthand what it's like living with the Powerpuff Girls and Professor Utonium. Now, first things first, I know that this episode is a blatant contradiction of Not So Secret Service, and yes, that is certainly a problem. I don't want that neglect to be ignored just because I'm ranking this episode as one of the best of the season. The ultimate takeaway here for me is that Brain Lord is, by itself, Fantastic, I love it, and if I had to choose between this and Not So Secret Service, I would prefer this interpretation without a doubt. There is nothing of value being lost by removing the other episode. The way Mojo's mood heel turns practically every 30 seconds in that one is so difficult to follow that it's just mind numbing. Brain Lord though, I love this episode and the way that we can see Mojo's hesitation to destroy the Powerpuff Girls once he formulates a bond with them. It works because the plot starts out as an evil scheme to destroy the girls, but the one thing he didn't count on or anticipate was formulating a personal connection with the Utoniums, one that he hadn't felt since he probably became evil. It's a missed opportunity that the show didn't reference the fact that he was once the professor's assistant or anything in that department for that matter, but it's not a deal breaker. It would have been awesome though if the experience brought Mojo back to how things were before he became an evil chimp since this new show apparently believes he was a well-behaved and loyal pet rather than the rowdy ball of destruction that he was in the original. I guess just seeing a lighthearted story in the reboot for once gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm happy watching this episode. I don't entirely know why, it just makes me content. I think the time period I had watched this episode in may have had an influence on my feelings towards it because everything seemed so grim at the time, in real life, and this being a somewhat positive portrayal of people was a nice escape. The way that the girls treat this stranger with such sympathy and kindness is so gratifying to see. Considering the way the real world usually works, I guess it's just reassuring to witness people being kind to others. Like, even the professor is serving him the best spaghetti Brain Lord's ever had. Actually witnessing the Utoniums take this lonely person in after he lost everything and help him regain his footing is heartwarming to say the least. I don't know man, I just think this is a feel good episode. There's no arguing between the girls, which is so much of a rarity. There's hardly any disagreements at all, it's just the girls being nice to somebody. That's so rare in this show, you never see the girls being kind, valiant citizens who look out for the town. Most of the time it's the citizens being assholes to the girls, or the girls being assholes to each other, and no one getting along. It's all about disagreement and conflict with the reboot. There's almost always arguments. Always. It's like a staple of practically every single episode, except for this one. I shit you not, watch any other episode of the reboot and I guarantee you, you will either see one of the girls being a contrarian, two of the girls fighting with each other, or all three of them, or the girls fighting with some other outside force. And not like superhero punching fighting, I'm talking like pitiful arguing. It doesn't matter what episode it is, there's gotta be disagreement. As I said with Total Eclipse, the only aspect I don't like is the ending, where the girls reveal they knew it was Mojo the whole time because that ruins a lot of the significance. I honestly wish that Bubbles' one line was just removed entirely because the episode would be all the better for it. Just cut out the part where she says, bye Mojo, and have him fall in the black hole portal without the girls knowing it was him. That instantly enhances the significance of his sacrifice on both sides. 
I think Mojo throwing himself away was a great call after all that the Utoniums had done for him, and that by itself is all that's needed in order to communicate Mojo's change of heart and new perspective on life. This wasn't Mojo's final episode of the series unfortunately, even though it would have been really fitting, but if it were to be treated as his closure episode just like Lights Out was for Silico or even Largo for Allegro, I would have been satisfied with it. Again, had that one change to the ending been made. Speaking of which... <laughs> Oh my goodness, what a mess Largo turned out to be. Just as Painbow hit the number 3 worst of season 1, its season 3 counterpart is mimicking the exact same ranking. I'd be willing to argue that Largo tries to have more going on in it than any other episode of the series. Like, I know that the reboot has had plenty of episodes where it's trying to do too much at once, but this one takes the cake above all else. For starters, Blossom and Buttercup are having an argument over a broken space tow truck action figure that Blossom placed behind the door because Buttercup refused to put it away. It ended up getting broken because Buttercup made a dramatic entrance and slammed the door. The flaws with both sides is that Buttercup should obviously clean up after herself and not leave her toys out for others to trip on, and Blossom should have known better than to just shove the mess behind a door because that's not a real solution to the problem. She didn't clean it up, she just pushed it somewhere else. Who keeps their toys behind a door anyways? It's said that Blossom knew Buttercup slammed doors open so she should have known better, and that's another thing. Maybe Buttercup shouldn't go around slamming doors everywhere. Bubbles, meanwhile, gets caught up in the middle of this but doesn't want to choose sides, and so she goes to find the professor, but that's where conflict number two comes into play because just as the rainbow hypnotized everyone in Townsville to party in Painbow, a rain cloud is now making everybody sad. Even the marine biologist character that we've never heard of and never saw again and was literally only included as a cheap way to appeal to the positive female role model ideal without actually committing and putting in the effort to develop a realistic character that would fit that identity. Mrs. Rhonda, my favorite marine biologist. I need some advice. Why bubbles, of course. Not. Seriously, this was such an insincere attempt, it's not even funny. Even the delivery of the line inflects how transparent it is. So then, Bubbles flies up to the mayor who points out the cloud to her because she never noticed it up to this point, which ties into the same issue that Painbow had where the girls were magically immune to the weather effects despite no explanation being given. I fully understand Chemical X could be the answer, but there is no indication of that in either of these episodes, and Blossom and Buttercup are still fighting unaffected while this is going on inside their house, mind you. I think this aspect is more frustrating than it was in Painbow because Largo is the counterpart to that season one episode, and yet it couldn't be bothered to improve upon the flaws of the original and instead just repeat them again, paying no mind to the criticism that was given towards the first one. That's the thing, choosing to ignore criticism will only hinder oneself because they'll never be able to grow if they ignore the people who talk about the pros and cons. Only paying attention to the positive reception will cause stagnation, and that doesn't do anybody any good. It just means that somebody who ignores criticism is doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. And that's clearly an example here with Largo. Next, Bubbles flies into the clouds and meets Largo, where we get our third conflict introduced, that being the argument that took place between Largo and Allegro some time ago. We don't know how long it was, could have been a year, could have been a decade, who knows, but one thing is certain, their backstory is random and wildly out of place in the Powerpuff Girls. I mean, the reboot itself just throws together random shit all the time. I don't know what the rules of this world are, I don't know what the structure is, there's no consistency or level of immersion in this world that the show is trying to create. What the hell is a cosmic bear anyways? I get that the episode is trying to establish a backstory for Allegro and Largo, but it only created more questions rather than answering previous ones. And I still never got an explanation for why Allegro's panda appearance is just a shell for this blue teddy bear thing on the inside. That attribute was just outright dropped after season 1 for whatever reason because it never appears here. Basically, the two characters just couldn't stand living together so Allegro left and Largo moped around until now. Which also is confusing because 
what is motivating Largo to depress everyone in Townsville? I proposed theories in my review, but nothing is outright presented in the episode, so that's yet another hindrance to the plot. A character's motivation isn't something that can just always be assumed. When there are multiple possibilities as to why this character is doing this thing, it certainly matters which of those possibilities it actually is. If he's intentionally doing it because he's envious of others, that's much different than him accidentally affecting the town with his reign when he didn't mean to. That completely changes the perception of the character, but the episode doesn't give any clues as to which way it's supposed to go, so I'm just left sitting asking, why is he doing this? Well, we never get an answer. Next comes conflict number four, as Bubbles gets a call from the mayor that he's going to blow up the town after he takes a depression nap, which then places an artificial time limit on Bubbles because she only has so much time before the whole city is destroyed. All right, you follow me so far? Well, I hope so, but in case you need a rundown, we've got Blossom and Buttercup arguing, a rain cloud depressing everyone, Largo and Allegro not being on good terms, and the mayor threatening to blow up the town. So now, let's bring in a fifth conflict. Bubbles wants to host a tea party in order to bring everyone together and help solve their problems, but nobody else really wants to partake in it. Buttercup and Blossom are having their argument on one side, Allegro is unwilling to communicate with Largo on the other, and Bubbles is getting agitated with everyone because they won't do as she says. That is five, count them, five simultaneous conflicts all taking place at the exact same time, separate from each other, and an 11 minute cartoon where there's barely enough time to handle more than two in general, let alone five. It all comes tumbling down when the resolution to everything is just Bubbles screaming at the characters to hug and they instantaneously forgive each other, which solves every single problem present and yet the mayor blows up the city anyways, so what was even the point of placing that stress on Bubbles in the first place? Don't get me wrong, I love the gag, in fact, I liked a lot of the humor in this episode because Largo's blunt and dry perspective as well as Allegro's leaving reaction were all priceless. But the explosion gag does come at the cost of making that entire conflict pointless and unnecessary to the episode because there's no resolution to it for Bubbles. She doesn't even know the city blows up. We just get a cutaway gag to the mayor blowing it up and that's it. Bubbles doesn't feel bad about failing to stop him. Bubbles doesn't even have any kind of emotional response to that happening. It literally has no significance on the episode because this is supposed to be all about Bubbles. Maybe the idea here it was going for was to have Bubbles so overwhelmed by all of these different problems, but the issue with that is that her solution is to scream at everyone. Getting frustrated and angry is rarely, rarely the solution to handling stressful situations, and most people usually advise to stay calm and not get agitated because that will just make the situation worse. Not the reboot though. The reboot says just yell at people to do as you say and all your problems will be solved. Force people to forgive each other whether or not they actually do, and then you'll be happy because you don't have to deal with it anymore. I could see this idea working if the episode was trying to be cynical and sarcastic, but it's not. It's straightforward. I will stand my ground on this. Largo is the worst case the reboot has ever had of trying to cram in too much conflict in such a little time. The tension between Largo and Allegro not getting along should have been the sole focus of this episode and nothing more. Blossom and Buttercup's disagreement was unnecessary. We get that every other episode. And constantly cutting back to it just takes away time from the other problems at hand. Also, Allegro's villain status was completely ignored here too. It's as if the girls just completely forgot what he tried doing to them in Somewhere Over the Swing Set and now they're comfortable just sitting at a table together. And as I said, I dislike how unclear it is on whether or not Largo is intentionally trying to affect the rest of Townsville, or if Sadness just follows him wherever he goes and he has no control over that. It could just be that he's lethargic and sorrowful all the time, or maybe he's making everyone else feel the way he does because if he can't be happy then no one else deserves to be either. I don't know. Point is, this episode is a complete mess to where I would say it's actually worse than Painbow because, twerking aside, everything Painbow did is done here too, along with a whole slew of other problems added on top of it. Yes, Largo even has the outdated meme-worthy lingo. <sighs> At least I'm glad I never have to discuss anything Allegro-related ever again. Right? Right? <laughs> There is one who still slips through my fingers. Jerry, that kid's a walking Petri dish. What? No, I meant bubbles.
I think The Octfather is single-handedly the most surprising episode of the reboot I have ever seen. I went into this expecting it to be horrendous. I mean, a Godfather parody? That's doomed to fail from the start. Or so I thought. Turns out this is the best princess episode in the reboot, bar none. In the episode, she and her crew capture the other school students, stuff snuggle toys when they aren't looking, and hold them for ransom in order to weigh power over the other kids. She's essentially using blackmail to maintain her status at the top of the totem pole in a way that actually works for the element part of the elemental high school kids. It doesn't really work as well when the bullies come into question halfway through the episode, but when it's focusing on the actual six-year-olds, it definitely makes sense. This is also a case where Bubbles' fierceness and threatening persona actually shines through. It's not just a random outburst of rage that gets overdone quickly like it always was in season one. She has an actual motive and she's more based in contempt rather than outright anger. Bubbles knows how to instill fear in the person that thinks they have power over her. She plays the long game and messes with her opponent psychologically. The way she gets into Princess's head just by talking in a serious tone, sending her ominous messages, and staring her down is a great way for her to express her assertiveness. She will not let Princess sleep at night. She will get her to a point of having so much guilt for what she's done about it that it physically suffocates her. Every attempt that Princess makes to get Bubbles to do what she wants is thwarted by Bubbles one-upping her and putting her back in her place instead. I really do like the idea that this episode introduces how Princess has managed to rule over the school. I think that if this were actually set up in season one, this could have led to future stories in later seasons that would have built off the idea. Better late than never, certainly, but I do like to think about what could have been. Another aspect I like is that the episode properly executes its running gag, a rarity for the show. It's not just the same thing repeated each time, and it's not overdone a million times the way things like wheels were. The gag I'm particularly referring to is when Dancer Guy gets mauled by a tiger. The first time he gets attacked is when he interrupts Princess, which is where we're informed that this will happen every single time he interrupts her. The second time he interrupts her is a case where he was trying to give her a fair warning, but he still messed up. He met the same requirements as the first time around, but this time there were slightly different circumstances because he thought he was being helpful, unlike the first time where he was rudely interrupting. You get your more box, you want some flapjacks? <sighs> yeah, I'll take care of it. Yo, tiger! <laughs> The third time the gag appears, he realizes what he did and sicks the tiger on himself in order to surprise us once again with a different method of presenting the same joke. This is how every basic joke is usually executed using the rule of three, not just doing the same thing every single time like the way the horse gag was in Hustle Cop. It's a wonder to me that the most basic setup for a joke was such a challenge for the reboot to pull off. The climactic nightmare that Princess has towards the end where Bubbles sneaks into her home and sends her falling off of the roof of her mansion felt very dark in tone, and I found the way this was handled brilliantly well done. The visuals and setting really accentuated the overall mood that the scene is creating in order to bring Princess's nightmare to life. The Oct Father sets out to give us a story about Princess getting a taste of her own medicine after the tables turn on her, and it works. She messed with the bull and she got the horns. That's what happens when people mess with the wrong person. It usually comes back to bite them harder than anticipated. And Princess did this all because of two reasons. One, Bubbles has managed to avoid her grasp longer than anybody else at the school and her lust for power kept pushing her to steal Octi. And two, she wanted to win a sculpture contest that the school was hosting at the end of the week and needed Bubbles to help her do it. I kinda wonder if this implies Princess once captured Sergeant Ducky and President Dinosaur from Buttercup and Blossom respectively, but that's sadly never acknowledged. Overall, I definitely enjoyed the Octfather way more than I anticipated. The fact that the Godfather reference, while certainly present to anybody who's seen the films, do not intrude on the actual episode, is great, and they don't feel half-hearted the way the Star Wars reference did in The Spoon. I'd happily recommend this episode to anybody. It's easily my favorite Princess Morbucks episode of the reboot without question. <laughs> Championship game is tomorrow. Let's work on defense.
So I mentioned in my Rebel Rebel review that there exists an unholy trinity of episodes in Season 3, and while I may have only listed Rebel Rebel as a dishonorable mention, it suffice to say that that's the least offensive of the three. The next two episodes, however, wholeheartedly deserve to be acknowledged as the two worst episodes of the season. The first of which being Sideline Dad. This here is an episode that rubs me the wrong way on a multitude of different levels, ranging from the incompetence of the professor to the sheer abundance of writing oversights and lack of care that is glaringly apparent based on the vast number of inconsistencies. The basic setup of the episode involves the Powerpuff Girls playing soccer while their neglectful father figure chooses to read a book instead of giving his own children the time of day because words on a page are more fascinating to him. The episode tries to play it off as the professor not being a sports guy, but the dude was literally established to be a basketball playing wizard in Hustle Cup, so that logic completely falls through. It even goes far enough to do the stupid, I don't know how to pronounce this word because the concept is so alien to me trope that further enhances the frustration of watching this character behave like an incessant man child. And that doesn't even scratch the surface of the episode's problems. This thing has oversights galore, starting with the entire setup for the conflict in the episode in the first place. So the Powerpuff Girls are obviously upset with their father for completely ignoring them while they played their soccer match, going so far as to ask what he thought about it when chilling at Penguin Pete's after the game. He tells them they played well, and the girls retort by saying they lost by three, even though the scoreboard listed 0-0 and the only goal scored was the one made by Bubbles, which also happened to be the game-winning goal because the match literally ended after she scored with their entire team celebrating as though they had just been victorious. So how how on earth are we, or the professor, supposed to believe they lost when the episode clearly depicted a victory? The episode wants to vilify Professor Utonium by presenting false information. The dude is already guilty of not paying attention to them. This aspect was wholly unnecessary and diminishes the credibility of what the episode is trying to preach. This episode is also incredibly guilty of saying one thing happens, but then depicting something completely different, whether it's in the visual department or the writing. Like, did it even pay attention to itself? There are plenty of other errors too, such as the scene where the episode literally calls Robin Snyder Candace, despite the fact that they literally established her name was Robin in the exact same scene. And why is Robin being chased by a lion? <laughs> You no, you're not. Like, this is a new level of incompetence. Don't even get me started on the whole waves spiel again either. For those who haven't seen my review, long story short, the professor is a physicist slash chemist and would totally know what a wave is, but the show decided to completely disregard his character for the sake of making him look like a complete fucking idiot. It's the same thing with him not understanding computers. It makes no sense for the character, and the episode decided to sacrifice that for the sake of a joke that isn't even that good. And then, seeing the professor just lose his cool over a child's soccer game isn't fun at all. It's a miserable watch, and this may be my personal experience talking, but I see nothing of value in that. Yeah, we get it. There are people like this in the real world, and those people need to get a hold of themselves, but the episode hardly does anything to really show why it's an issue. He just kind of rages out for 10 seconds, and then the episode completely glosses over his rage, and it never gets acknowledged again. Similarly to Rebel Rebel, the professor's behavior changes so erratically without any rhyme or reason. The episode starts with him being isolated and neglectful, so then he decides he's gonna study soccer to be a good dad. Oops, the conflict's been resolved in the first three minutes. Now what do we do? Well, how about a montage where he dresses up like a clown? That'll do it. I mean, it's certainly fitting for his character. And then the episode introduces a new conflict, where the head soccer coach decides to bench Blossom and let another girl start instead, causing the professor to take great offense to this and start an argument which causes the head coach to quit the team altogether, leaving all of these children and parents hanging so the professor steps in without anybody else's say to be their coach to prove that he could do a better job and make sure they win the championship even though they were already winning so there's no point in dramatically changing their strategy. 
Then, he brings in a robot referee to create more problems later when the professor argues with it because he believes it is making incorrect calls, even though it is established to be perfectly fair without any human error. Yet, the episode goes and depicts the robot incorrectly calling Blossom offsides, which further enhances the professor's credibility and inherently justifies his anger. Like, if you want to portray the professor as being completely ridiculous, you shouldn't make him look right. Yeah, maybe he's overreacting, but he's right. He's right to be upset. The referee was clearly wrong. There's a plot point where we find out that the robot referee was sold to the professor by his evil clone, which goes absolutely nowhere, and it's a shame because one drawback of him buying that robot could have been that the referee was actually inaccurate, and that's the whole reason why his evil clone gave him to him in the first place. He purposely sold him a robot that incorrectly makes calls against the professor's team. That would have been interesting. It's just a shame that this whole evil clone thing is nothing more than a three-step run gag that could be completely removed from the plot and nobody would care. Sure, the professor shouldn't be acting the way he is, mind you, but the episode, as I said, gives him a valid reason, and considering everything that is happening in that scene, I don't believe that was its intent. I honestly don't think the episode was intentionally trying to make the robot give an incorrect call. It comes across as though the episode wants the professor to look like he's overreacting over nothing, or that he's the one that's incorrect. But while he is overreacting, his reason for being angry is validated because the robot blatantly called Blossom off sides when she wasn't. It completely fails at getting its message across and it just ends up contradicting itself. The episode also has the trope of figments in his mind running the operation, but other shows have done it so much better and this instance is completely unmemorable. The climax and ending also prove inconsequential because the robot threatens to explode and destroy everyone in the area, but then the timer goes on for well over a minute despite the characters diegetically only having 15 seconds to act. There's also the fact that the girls defeat him by blowing him up, even though that's what he was going to do anyways, and the show treats this like a victory instead of turning it into something comedic like the characters going oops after the damage was done, or do anything with this for that matter. The girls fail to stop the robot from blowing up, yet the episode doesn't acknowledge this or poke fun at it in any way, and instead plays this completely straight, as though they saved the day heroically when they didn't. They completely failed to stop it from blowing up. Again, the episode wants you to believe one thing, but portrays something completely different. It wants you to believe that the girls lost, but it portrays that they won. It wants you to believe the professor's a lunatic for overreacting to a call that was completely valid when it actually wasn't. It wants you to believe that the robot blowing up is going to have a negative consequence and the girls need to stop it, and then it blows up and the girls are treated as heroes. Ugh, there is nothing of value to be found in Sideline Dad. Nothing at all. This is a complete waste of time and would have been better off having never been created in the first place. Even still, however, there is one more episode that stands above the rest as the worst episode of season three. But first, we need to shift gears for a second and take a look at the best episode the series has to offer. <laughs> If you've seen my review of this episode, then you already knew it was coming. Blunder Cup is my favorite episode of season three without question. This is an episode that I knew was never going to be dethroned for the number one spot after I saw it. I sang its praises a bunch before and I'm here to do it again. The episode begins by setting up Buttercup as being this extreme, capable, radical individual who's super cool and able to do everything with style and grace. She's strong, independent, and won't back down from a challenge as illustrated by the video she posts online to her sisters. This is then immediately contrasted with the following morning where she loses all of her abilities and is suddenly incapable of completing the exact same things we had seen her performing the previous day, indicating that something weird is going on. The episode chooses to echo the events with an opposite result, which does an excellent job at emphasizing how dramatic of a difference these blenders are having on Buttercup's life. 
We can clearly see her response to her failures are exhibiting the opposite reactions to the success she was experiencing prior, and is a great visual indicator that leads into the core of the problem. Namely, that Buttercup has had her body stolen by this other character that I refer to as Butters because they're never actually given a name. Butters here saw Buttercup's videos online and decided that they wanted to live out Buttercup's life rather than their own, and using their butter fusion powers, they were able to swap bodies with Buttercup, essentially trading lives, if you will. Another aspect of this episode that I adore is that it actually provokes multiple ideas within my mind that I'm recognizing through what is shown. This episode actually makes me think, okay? I can't say that very often for this show. For instance, the fact that this is indirectly showcasing a situation in which posting something on the internet came back to bite somebody indirectly. It's definitely true, whenever you post something online, you have no idea who's seeing what you're putting out there, and this is something that I definitely keep in the back of my mind whenever I'm releasing something online. This is also why many people prefer to remain more anonymous and keep their identities on the down low, for the sake of their own protection. Now certainly, there aren't any butter people out there looking to steal your body from you, that we know of, but it is communicating this idea to its viewers. This is an allusion to how people steal others' lives in the real world via other means. Addresses, bank accounts, credit cards, social security, phone numbers, all sorts of various aspects of people's lives can be stolen online if the innocent are not careful about protecting themselves. And the best part is that this episode isn't lecturing this to us. We aren't told outright how it's bad and this and that and the other thing. This is presented to us through an actual story. We as human beings are able to recognize the consequences of this situation by ourselves, and the episode is all the better for actually letting us do that for once. This episode isn't even really about the threats of strangers on the internet. It's more about Buttercup losing her body, but all of that is an after effect of her not being careful. Heck, it's super relatable to me. I mean, I don't know everybody that's watching this video right now. In fact, I don't know most of you at all. I don't even know what time of day, what day it is, where you're at. I don't know any of that information. All I know is that you're hearing my voice at the current time you happen to be watching this, even though I've recorded it several months in the past. I'm getting a little meta here, I apologize. I'm serious, I don't know your names or your personal lives, and it's funny yet weird to think that we're all kind of strangers here. But the fact that we've all come together due to our overlapping interest in the reboot and my episode reviews makes it a very special corner of the internet. I love this little community we've built where we get to come together each week and talk about another episode of the Powerpuff reboot. It's kind of like a book club in a way, but just specifically catered to this show. I realize I'm going off on a tangent here, but I really just want to illustrate why this portion of the episode hits so close to home for me personally. Butters' backstory comes from a place of a kid who achieved what they had always wanted but was disappointed with the reality of the outcome. Their ultimate dream did not live up to their expectations, which raises the question of whether or not obtaining one's own utopian dream is actually worth acquiring. Where do you go from there? Blundercup really gets me thinking about all sorts of ideas, and that combined with the unsettling scenario of losing your life because somebody else is taking it away from you has always been something that's kind of messed with my mind. Specific examples of other instances that I can recall off the top of my head are things like that one Goosebumps book, Why I'm Afraid of Bees. Infinity Train had an episode kind of like this in book one, although that ended on a much happier note. There was also this children's book called The Sweetest Fig that my teacher read to me in like, fourth or fifth grade where the guy ended up swapping bodies with his dog. Boy, I tell you, the ending to that book left an everlasting impression on me that I still remember to this day. Like, even just thinking about it gets me nauseous, and it's also the reason why I'll never go near a fig. And yes, I'm serious about that. That book scarred me enough to the point where figs actually make me feel nauseous. So, <laughs> there you go. I know that body swap episodes and films are one of the most common tropes out there, but I'm more so fixated on this because it's a specific subtrope in which the person unwillingly loses their body to somebody else who wants it, and nobody other than the person who now has their body knows, so it's difficult for them to reach out to other people for help. In some scenarios, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Then the possessor essentially tries to take over the original host and wipe them out from existence. Oh, Get Out was also similar to this in some ways. I forgot about that. Great movie, by the way. 
That concept has always stuck with me because it disturbs me on a level unlike any other and this episode capitalizes on that perfectly. The fake out ending where Butters claims they realized they were wrong and was going to give Buttercup her body back only to trick her into letting her guard down and attempting to murder her outright? That's a dark twist for this show and certainly unexpected. The ending is also super ambiguous on whether or not Buttercup was herself or if it was really Butters because her voice is inflected as though it's a mix between the two. Heck, some people interpret it as both of them got merged together into one entity. I don't know if this was intentional or if the voice actress was just strained that day after having to do both voices, but either way, it does add to the ambiguity of the ending. Blunder Cup, despite the title being a huge missed opportunity, has provoked more conversation and discussion than any other episode in my own personal experience. It's got a competently threatening villain character, a great progression that moves at just the right pace, no overdone in-your-face gags or preachy moral, this is everything a PPG reboot episode should be. The fight is decent, superb by reboot standards, the villain and hero both have reasonable and justified motives for working towards their goals, it's unanimous in my eyes, no questions or doubt about it. Blunder Cup is hands down the best reboot episode, period. It gets everything right, it stirs up a conversation teaches a lesson using a more subdued and intelligent approach, includes action, everything comes together brilliantly. No other episode comes close in this show. This is in a league of its own, and I only wish the reboot was able to create more episodes on this level. Some may disagree, but that's just me, you know? <laughs> Sorry, uh, yes, three years. But what about the Mojo's podcast? He just got his 10th subscriber! Oh. And here we have number one, the worst of the worst, the most repulsive episode that season three had to offer. And that episode is none other than Quarantine. The basic premise of the episode is that Professor Utonium is transporting a radioactive material and needs the girls to help escort him, but then Mojo shows up to steal the vial and ultimately causes chaos that ends in it exploding and exposing all three of the girls and Mojo to the substance. This forces the professor to quarantine them in a locked room where they have no exposure to the outside world. Seems logical, right? Well, there's a catch. Namely, that the virus the characters were exposed to was a rare anomaly that has the ability to cause somebody to turn into a Saturnian porcuswine, and my god, does the logic of this virus make absolutely zero sense. So little, in fact, that it utterly destroys the entire plot. But at some point, one of you will burst out of your skin and turn into a Saturnian porcupine. I drew this in between panic attacks. So as the episode establishes, despite all four characters being exposed to the virus, only one of them will become the porcupine, while the other three will remain completely unaffected. I had initially mentioned this in my review, but it bears repeating. A better way to create the exact same scenario was to change the virus, to a parasite. One single living entity. This way, it is totally believable that only one person could be infected. Viruses do not just infect one person and ignore everybody else. Also, the professor rules out the possibilities that none of them are infected, or more than one of them are infected. Like, he knows for a fact that only one of them is infected, but he doesn't know which one. Furthermore, viruses spread, so locking all four of them in the room together would just cause all four of them to become infected. So essentially, the professor just doomed all of his children. But oh man, the rabbit hole goes so much deeper than that. At one point, the professor enters into the room with his vial, right? Which he says is marked B for Buttercup, and has tested it to prove that she isn't infected. I ran some tests, and this sample marked B for Buttercup tested negative for porcupine DNA. Professor, all of our names start with a B. I know that, but in this case, I, uh, because you see, I, oh dear. Where did he get this sample from? Was it collected before he locked them in this room, or did he go in there to retrieve it at some point? Also, if he tested a sample from one of the girls and was able to prove it wasn't infected, why couldn't he just do that for all four of them one at a time? The episode explicitly establishes that he can detect whether or not a person is infected, even though he says he can't. And then for the sake of the episode, he just walks away after realizing that all three of his daughter's names start with a B. Okay? Again, why not just test them each one at a time? 
He also establishes that this virus could take up to three years in order to take effect and turn a person into a porky swine, so like, he has plenty of time. That's another thing. The episode never establishes if this transformation is going to be spontaneous or gradual, and in the latter's case, it would be far easier to tell who is infected because the changes can be observed over time. If the episode is claiming that nobody else is capable of being infected with this virus except the one, singular character, then why not just let the four of them live their lives normally and monitor them regularly? If more than one person was capable of being infected, which is how it should be, then all four of them should be infected by the virus right now. You know what would have fixed this problem? Making it a parasite. This entire point is rendered moot, however, because a character does end up transforming into a porky swine by the end of the episode, and it is very instantaneous, but more on that shortly. I still need to go over how asinine it is that the professor locked all four of the characters in the same room together. Not because they're all at risk for being infected, because again, the episode tells us that they aren't, even though that's near impossible, but rather because of how the professor describes the porcupine as a vicious monster that will obliterate everything in its path. So then why the fuck did he lock all of these characters in the same room together where they can't escape from one another? He's essentially setting three of these characters up for a death sentence because the fourth is going to slaughter each of them. Why not lock them all up in their own separate rooms? That way the three that aren't infected are allowed to go free after the culprit has been determined. We know for a fact that at least two of the Powerpuff Girls are not infected, so it's not like the professor is going to be losing all of them or something. But no, this man knowingly sets up his own children to be slaughtered and shows no remorse or distress for it. I just discovered that the Saturnian Porcupine swine is actually a nice monster. See? After it's viciously devoured any living thing nearby with its massive, razor-sharp teeth! Okay, time to get some shut-eye. Good night! He's not concerned at all. In fact, he's smiling about this. Reboot Professor Utonium is portrayed as such a swell character when the reality is that he is a horrible parent, one of the worst I've ever seen in an animated series. It's despicable what this reboot has turned him into. This man has the ability to save at least two of his children from an untimely demise and he chooses to let them all die instead. Heck, if Mojo were the infected one, he could save all three. And as if that wasn't enough, there's the big reveal at the end where we find out that none of the characters in quarantine were actually infected with the virus. Oh no, that luxury goes to the professor himself. Get me! I mean, help me! Professor? Are you okay? This honestly is just a twist for the sake of being a twist, and in no way does this make any sense for what the episode has established. This entire script is rushed, it feels like none of it was given any thought and just shit out for the sake of getting it done. The writing is an utter mess, in fact out of every episode in the reboot, I think this episode single-handedly has the most oversights of any episode in the show. 120 episodes and not a single one comes close to the amount that Quarantine has. Oh, don't get me wrong, I still despise your good man Mojo Jojo and Once Upon a Townsville, but there is no denying that this is the epitome of laziness to the fullest degree. I'm not even referring to how this episode coincidentally predicted 2020. Hell, none of what happened that year has anything to do with my issues with the episode, and I even wrote my original script before the quarantine even started. Heck, you could say any quarantine episode of any show could have predicted that because it wasn't really a prediction, it was just an episode about the concept of quarantining. It's not like 2020 invented that. But as I was saying, the professor is revealed to be the porcupine all along. Even though he was wearing a hazmat suit inside his vehicle and did not come into contact with the explosion from the vial unlike the other four characters who got blasted in the face with it. How? How on earth was it the professor that got infected but none of the other characters? Well, the episode certainly doesn't explain it. Again, this is just a twist for the sake of a twist. And here's the other thing. This man clearly knows a lot about this virus, right? So I'm inclined to believe he would know if he was susceptible to the virus or not. And if he didn't know he was susceptible, but he somehow was, then the episode should have shown us how he became infected without him knowing because obscuring that information makes everything here incomprehensible to anyone who actually stops and thinks about this for more than three seconds. So with that said, let's say he did know that he was susceptible. Why didn't he lock himself up? 
Hmm? I would understand if he knew he was the porcupine and he locked the girls up so they couldn't stop him because somehow being infected made him evil, but then why on earth would he expose it to them about every little detail regarding the virus and porcupines if he was essentially telling them what was about to happen? The other thing is that he specifically asks the girls to help him as he transforms. He shows no sign of excitement that his transformation is complete. What I'm essentially doing here is I'm offering up the possibility that the professor was infected and he knew it, and the infection made him evil so he didn't reveal that fact to the girls or Mojo, but nothing in the episode actually presents that, so this alternative idea that I've offered doesn't actually fit in the way that the episode was written. If it was written around that idea, then this twist would make a lot of sense actually. I am more inclined to believe that he knew he was susceptible but didn't do anything about it, which inherently makes him an even shittier person because he was technically there. Even if his odds of being infected seem impossibly low, he was present at the scene and managed to drag all four of these characters back to his house to lock them up, so that is more than enough for him to do the same for himself. Why doesn't he lock himself up too? If he was present where the virus was released, he should have to quarantine too. But he doesn't because he's selfish, I guess. It also doesn't help that any of the other characters never question him on this. They never even think about the fact that the professor was there too. They just take his word for it because they're mindless pawns as dictated by the writing that relies so heavily on this convenience. If the show was actually bothered to give their characters the ability to think, then they would be able to see right through the professor here. Instead, it writes them like they're fucking idiots. Now, looking back over my script as I'm recording this, I've come to realize that I've written a lot of my arguments based around the assumption that the girls would lose to the porcupine. I haven't, however, considered the possibility that the girls would actually beat the porcupine. The reason I make this assumption is because the episode presents it as though the girls don't stand a chance of fighting them. Between everything the professor says and the way that the characters react to it, it's a clear indication to me that they don't stand a chance against it to fight it physically, and if you actually look at the ending of the episode, the girls never even fight it. They literally just play keep away and then turn the professor back to normal before they can even start any fist-to-fist -fist combat. Besides, this is the Powerpuff reboot we're talking about here. I mean, how often do the girls actually end up beating a monster? Again, I think it's fair for me to assume that the girls wouldn't be able to beat this thing in a fight. Also, what was the point of even mentioning that the virus would take three years for it to come into effect? The episode is setting the audience up to believe this is going to be a gradual, long-term process, and then nope, it just spontaneously happens when it's most convenient for the writing because reasons. It's an utterly pointless detail that didn't need to be included. The episode could have just said 48 hours, and then boom, the exact same outcome would be achieved. And heck, I'd say it'd do the episode better, because then Mojo and the girls would have more of a legitimate reason to be panicking to figure out which one of them is infected. Oh my gosh, I'm not even done yet. This has given me a headache. Okay, so another point of contention that needs to be discussed is that the girls and Mojo waste a bunch of time doing nonsensical things while blaming and attacking each other because that will somehow solve the problem and cure them of the virus? I get beating up Mojo because he's evil, but these are just minor distractions in between the professor's massive exposition dumps. None of their accusations amount to anything, which is a shame because the entire idea of Mojo Jojo and the Powerpuff Girls being locked in a room together is a genius setup for an episode. There's so much that could be done with such a simple concept like that, and I guarantee the original series could have had a field day with this. The reboot, though, not so much, because this is the epitome of wasted potential, and that is another reason why I rank this as the number one worst. Out of every episode in the entire season, this one had the most potential to be great and failed to capitalize more than any other episode. One would think that at least Blossom out of all the characters would be capable of realizing that their arguing and bickering and accusing isn't actually getting them anywhere and is doing nothing to stop the virus from taking over its host. It doesn't matter what they do, they can argue over it all they want. It's not going to stop the virus. It's pointless and a waste of time. There's no reason to do it. It literally just feels like filler in between each of the professor's exposition dumps. The ending of the episode isn't any more satisfying either because after the professor transforms into the porcupine and rages out briefly, it goes away and then Mojo and the girls are able to just walk out of the room? 
Like, they literally just walk out. And sure, I get that the porky swine damages the door a little bit, but it didn't break the door down and it certainly didn't unlock it. You'd also think the professor would have built a door that the girls were incapable of getting through from the inside. That's the whole point of the quarantine, isn't it? Mojo and the girls are just magically able to open the door even though they were supposed to be locked in that room without any means of escape. So what the hell is up with that? That just shits in the face of the entire concept of the episode and it proves that the professor wasn't even really quarantining them. They could have left at any time and there was nothing the professor could have done to stop them. What the fuck? So he failed to quarantine these characters, even though that's the entire basis for why he's doing what he's doing in the first place. And then to make matters worse, it ends with Mojo getting eaten and the professor turning back to normal with Mojo still inside him, so what a great note to end the episode on, right? Ugh, quarantine can get lost. Undoubtedly the worst episode of the season, bar none. Sideline Dad may have been an obnoxious portrayal of the character, but at the end of the day, at least he was trying to support his girls at certain points in that episode. In this one though, he is absolutely unforgivable. And that is what I consider to be the absolute worst episode of season 3 by a landslide. But let's not end off this video on a negative note. There's still more PPG 2016 videos on the way. I've already been preparing some for other reboot related topics that tie into the show without being outright reviews of the episodes themselves. The Powerpuff reboot also had a run of IDW comics put out back during the midpoint of Season 1, as well as its fair share of games and apps posted on both CN's website and mobile app stores. I'm at the point where I can announce that I'll be doing videos on both of those subjects in the coming weeks, followed by another exciting video after that, which I'm really looking forward to putting out, although I won't say what that one is quite yet. Season 3 was an interesting run, and even though I consider Season 2 to be the best of the series, this one was still way above season 1 in terms of quality. Overall, however, still not a great show. It completely misses the point of what Powerpuff Girls is, and it truly is a shame that the show ended up being such a disappointment. Still though, rather poetic that the series literally ends on one of the worst of the season. Nah, but with that said, thank you guys so much for tagging along for the ride, and I hope you all look forward to the special bonus videos I've got coming. It's still surreal to me to think that you guys are sticking with my content long after this show has left people's minds, so again, thank you. I really appreciate it. That said, I'll see you guys in my next video.